everybody. Welcome to Founder Talks. I'm your host from Inside.com, Stephanie Zielinski, and I am joined today by Todd, Rachel, and Eric, three people who were involved in AI LA and now have an exciting new project to tell you all about. So I will ask each of them to introduce themselves. Todd, how about you? Hey, Todd Terrazas. I'm the founder and the executive director of the AI LA community. As a 501c3 nonprofit that I started about 20 in April 2016, Came from humble beginnings of just a chatbot meetup group that then spun into this nonprofit AILA that really focuses on accelerating innovation for social good. And so pretty much we're conveners at heart on a regular basis, convening people to get them to understand how AI is impacting their personal and professional lives. Great. And Rachel, yeah. go ahead. I'm Rachel Joy Victor. I've worked with Todd with AILA for a while. My background is in computational neuroscience, was always interested in its application to storytelling and experience design. So that's been a kind of consistent theme through my work of supporting emerging storytelling and experience. And that's how I got involved with thinking about the data side of things and how that supports and creates tools for that and got involved with AILA and what we're building now. Rachel, did you say computational design? Computational neuroscience. Neuroscience. Oh, wow. And is there some overlap with computer science there? Yeah, it's, it's a joint program that looks both at neuroscience and computer science and programming. A lot of the people who are in that program go on to study AI and robotics at a deeper level. Wonderful. Okay, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Wilker, and I am squarely in the entertainment space, but always living at the intersection of entertainment and tech. So my background is I spent 15 years at Warner Brothers in a variety of capacities across a number of different business lines. Most recently was at Amazon before joining these two folks to try and build something new. What's been exciting is entertainment's gone through a lot of changes, drastic changes, and technology has disrupted it fairly significantly in the last 15 to 20 years. And so I saw a real opportunity to build something new and create something really exciting with these two fine folks. And we're very excited to, to tell you about it and talk about what, what AI entertainment content creation can do for the industry and for audiences. Cool. And before we move on, can you tell us a little more about what you did at Warner Brothers and Amazon? Yeah, for sure. So at Warner Brothers, I was on the, in the television group where I helped them scale up and build out their global marketing operation. I was also a television producer before that producing television series for them, series like The West Wing, Whose Line Is It Anyway, and a whole number of other, other series. So really have a, an understanding of sort of concept through execution and distribution that the entertainment industry that does in terms of monetizing their content. And then most recently, Warner Brothers was involved in the launch of HBO Max, which is now mm. Max, and then went over to Amazon to help do business development at the center of their entertainment properties and help connect audiences to the different offerings that they have. Okay. Yeah. The entertainment thread is running strong here in the future of tech and AI. So before we dive into your new project, Todd, can you give us a background of the amazing work that the nonprofit AI LA has done so far? Yeah. On a regular, we've been convening about how AI is impacting different industries. Two major areas of interest have always been around sustainability and climate sustainability, climate change, and healthcare and life sciences. And so we, since 2019, we've been hosting these two summits, Earth Summit in April and in the spring, and then a Life Summit in the fall that really help bring people together to understand the AI research behind developing new solutions to help solve challenges around climate, and then also how to solve challenges around health disparities. And so we've been doing those events where obviously LA has Caltech, USC's, UCLA, Chapman, LMU, a number of different amazing universities and colleges. And so just having a breadth of great researchers that coming out of those, coming out of those universities have been helping us as a community better understand how these technologies are going to impact our lives. And then also be able to at the same time, be able to help support the public's interests and be able to help them better understand what these technologies really are. Right. And so instead of it just being these headlines they're reading every day, especially before ChatGPT became the big, the big old mind within all the news newsrooms right now, it was always just consistently helping the public understand how AI is impacting their society. And then a third focus is really on the responsible development and application of these technologies. So even this year on June 16th, over at LMU Playa Vista's campus, we're going to be hosting our sixth annual 
uh, Responsible AI Symposium, where we get a debate and discuss AI ethics and fairness and accountability and the governance around it. And now more than ever, this conversation needs to be front and center for not only academics and practitioners of AI to be understand to having these conversations, but the general public and the actual end users of these technologies. So how much overlap is there between what AI LA does and their amazing mission and your new project? Maybe one of you could kick us off with a little teaser of what the new project is. So right, AI LA is a very inclusive organization. We're over 11,000 members now that meet on a regular basis. Everything, like I said before, from researchers to academics, practitioners to just AI enthusiasts, right? And we cover a wide range of different topics and interests. This new project that we're working on is primarily focusing on the entertainment media gaming industries, where we really see an opportunity now where Genitive AI is, is taking the world by storm, is disrupting every industry there is. And we really see an interesting opportunity for the entertainment industry to get a hold of this and really understand how it can be used ethically, first and foremost, and help support storytellers that normally wouldn't have a voice. And so our first part of our initiative with Fabric is to really start an accelerator where we're helping with product development and sales, given our network and our expertise to really focus again, to help solve business challenges for local organizations and the broader audiences that are here in Los Angeles and around the world. Yeah. Fabric is very much focusing on the entertainment industry. And it's Fabric because it's about connecting things and tying things together and golden threads and all of that. I think with respect to what the connection is between the two and Todd, that was a great synopsis, but there's a lot in there to unpack. And I think both organizations are about spurring discussion, innovation, and creating community, both in different ways when it comes to a very hyper focus on entertainment, gaming, and those audience specific types of applications of AI. Our goal is to spur as much innovation as possible. So while we're not developing specifically an, a single application that will be used in that industry, we are trying to create as many companies as possible, creating value within that industry. And so that's why there's a focus on the accelerators. And what we're doing in terms of this is we are having conversations with major companies in the space, companies that both create content, create games, create worlds to have them mentor and sponsor individual companies in our cohort so that we aren't just solving problems in a vacuum. We're solving problems that will be commercialized for the industry. So they can be, we're going to create these lanes that are wide enough that it doesn't just apply to that single company. So I'm not saying this is a company, let's take a Warner Brothers where I come from. Warner Brothers has a huge problem set, which AI can help them solve. We want them to do it, do it ethically. As we know, there's a writer strike, for example, right now where that is forefront of the conversation, what constitutes a literary work, but we want to both on the creative side and on the tooling side, provide opportunities for companies to grow and to work with industry so that we can create a broader set of innovation. Rachel, anything to add? Yeah, I think part of what's really interesting of where we're positioned and what we're bringing to this and how we're able to build on kind of the relationships and community that Todd has built for many years is I think there's a lot of purpose to what AI and data can do within this space. I've personally worked with brands, with studios for the last 10 or so years, helping them think through what is the role of responsive experience, right? How are we moving towards experiences that are more personalized? to the individual that enables co-creation, that enables participation and interactivity. And for a long time, that's been a lot of weight on content creators, on studios to support that type of interactivity by creating manually so much content. And so even though there's been a desire for more interactive and immersive content, there's been less of a pipeline to support that. So now when we're thinking about generative creation and procedural creation, we have the tooling to meet that vision of what does storytelling look like when it's meeting the individual where they are. And so I think the really interesting part about a lot of what we're talking about with Fabric is it's the tooling for big studios, right, that have these problem sets. But it's also like, how is this coming alongside creators and helping them co-create? And then on the individual and participant level, it's how do I now have more responsive and customized experiences. So it's really thinking about how this technology can really touch people really along the continuum of content creation and consumption. 
All right. So fabric.ai aims to create as many companies as possible that spur forward this innovation that you're talking about. So the first question is, who is a good candidate for the accelerator and how do they apply? So we are working on a cohort-based approach. So we are vetting right now about 40 or so companies. We're going to narrow it down to five to eight companies. What we're really looking for is not just each technology and how it stands alone, but how do these things fit into a broader pipeline? And how are these things both solving questions and problems that, like Eric mentioned, we're seeing at the studio level in these conversations that are happening or at the tech company level, but also how do these things plug into each other? There are a lot of kind of pieces that need to be solved with, you know, the content creation and consumption pipeline. And so we're looking and evaluating based on how these things can, these tools can feed into each other. Connection is really important, I think, and the interoperability between it. So without giving away too much, we have a, built a fairly large map of the entire ecosystem of how, you know, the workflow of how content is created and started to overlay different ways in which these tools both expand creative choice and opportunity, as well as create efficiencies. I think most people tend to go to the efficiency route first, but where we see the true value is expanding the ability for storytellers and creatives to be able to have more optionality around how they tell those stories and engage audiences in new ways. So while we only have one point of view right now as to how that works, we do know that this over time will develop in ways that we can't even imagine. And so that's what we're really excited about. I was talking with a VR creator last week who was saying the next big tech company is going to be whoever figures out that interoperability where all of these immersive worlds can work together. And like Rachel was saying, generative tech allows for the user to be the creator of all of these worlds. And maybe it's not a company, maybe it's an accelerator like you guys. How would someone apply, Todd? Yeah, go to fbrc.ai. And there right now, it's a basic website. It'll be updated in the next couple of weeks, but you can go there and plug in your email and then we'll email you an application. Okay, so it's May 24th, 2023, and this website is a black box. What can we expect to see in a few weeks? Great question. We're keeping things close to the chest. Sure. Uh, think of our fabric brand as something that we're going to be rolling out gradually, right? And so there's a lot of pieces to it. It's not just going to be an accelerator. There's going to be this private membership type base. Even my background in community building, I really want to build a very unique membership base that is more focusing on value systems and what it means to be human. So there's a lot of different paid membership communities out there right now. Hampton's a great example where it's like you have to have $20 million worth of annual revenue and all these different types of criteria. And for us, we really believe that at the end of the day, the members that we really want involved with Fabric are just genuine people, people that are, we can trust. And it's more about, again, who you are as a person more than like how much money you make in a year. And we're taking a different approach to a private membership base where yes, it will be exclusive. It will be a paid type of tiered model. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to go through an interview. You're going to have to go through an application an interview. And then once you're even part of our membership, you're going to be getting performance reviews every quarter. Um, and that's just not just for you, the member, but it's also for us, the club, because we want to make sure that we're all working as a, in a growth mindset where we're all helping each other achieve each other's goals. I think it's probably right. worth mentioning too on the accelerator side that we're not approaching this without a lot of experience. I built a corporate accelerator for Warner Brothers over a number of years solving from a bottoms up standpoint. So I think to tie it to what Todd was saying, our goal is to have great people with great ideas who are really engaged and motivated. In some ways, that's the goal of many of these clubs, but the network effect and the ability to have all of us sharing ideas is what's going to spur innovation and connecting one company and having that other company mentor a different company within the cohort that those lines getting blurred is really the special nature of the culture we're trying to create. Todd calls it a no policy. We all know what the, <laughs> the blind, <laughs> but it's really your values and your dedication to the community is your currency. Yeah. Understanding the ethical background and motives with AI LA, I can see how that is going to be a huge part of your accelerator. In terms of what's coming next, we have a couple of events that are really exciting on the near horizon. There's AI and music as part of LA Tech Week hosted at FYI Will I Am Studio. 
and it's talking about new models around creation of music, but also what is the new evolving business models that arise out of that. We have a generative AI virtual world hackathon, which is, I think, really related to exploring some of the things we're going to be doing with Fabric in terms of what's the tooling around generating these virtual worlds, how do we support making those tools more accessible to creators, and we're doing it in the context of a hackathon where we're giving access to some of these tools to creators and seeing what they come up with. And also around the same time, we're going to release a white paper. So Eric was talking about how we've like mapped out the ecosystem and where we see opportunities for AI to augment existing workflows. So we'll be releasing that as the site goes live, probably around the same time in mid-June. And AI LA just had an event in Hollywood called AI on the Lot. Like Eric was talking about earlier, a lot of learning around the film industry. What were some of the big takeaways there that maybe would be informing the white paper for Fabric? There were a lot of great conversations. I think part of it was the great turnout of seeing like who all was there and who all was excited about this. I think in terms of applications, we saw really a range of how and when and where people are seeing this kind of fit into workflows. There was a great panel that I had the privilege of being able to moderate with people like Robert Legato, James Blevins, who are really involved in VFX pipeline and virtual production. And they're thinking about how it can really help them in the content generation process and really thinking through options at the start of the workflow. And then we also had people in some of the other panels talking about how can AI be the pipeline itself, right? How are you building everything mm -hmm. around generative AI script to screen? And we have others that are approaching it from building these, these virtual worlds and seeing how to create content out of them and using AI as a tool to have intelligent characters within it that are acting within the, the virtual world. So we saw it in different kind of pockets of how they're, they're different models evolving. And we're trying to see what the continuity is between those things, how we can help bridge the gap between a couple of those different models. And there's no doubt that there's a seismic shift happening in all industries affected by AI. Incredible potential. And I think there's also a lot of concern from individuals as to how that will affect, you know, what has been a fairly rigid set of jobs within the film industry. And those jobs will change. And there are definitely, there was differing opinions as to from, it's not going to change anything. It's just going to be a new tool set to, it's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And you need to upskill yourself pretty quickly to be able to adapt. And I don't think anybody knows. What we do know is things will change. And that's been a fun debate to listen to, to understand where the artistry comes into the technology. And does artistry still become that special X factor that makes content live versus whatever it may be, whether it be a set design, whether it be a virtual world, doesn't matter what it is. Where does the artistry come in and who inserts that artistry, whether it be AI or whether it be a human being and how that interaction works it was a really interesting debate. So we're talking about what's unknown and the things that are known right now are tools like Midjourney, Runway ML. Where are the gaps in tooling? What kind of companies do you hope to find to overlap and fill in the gaps in tooling in content creation for the entertainment industry? I think a lot of what we're seeing in this generation of tools that has kind of drawn a lot of this interest is a lot of them are generative AI tools. So they're taking the synthesis of deep learning, of pulling in a lot of input and being using that to generate content. And some of the companies we're seeing are building wrappers on top of that to make better user experience. I think to make it more actionable for creators, what we're going to need to see is tools that are able to extract the key elements from that and give more control to creators. Because right now, a lot of where creators are operating with these tools is playing with the parameters of the engine. And sometimes it's a process of figuring out how, what is the prompt engineering? How do I weight this? How do I do negative prompting to get the results I want? But there needs to be another layer of tools built on top of it that enables more control for the creator, especially for it to be feasible within production pipelines. So that's one area that we're definitely thinking about with regards to the need for additional tools. I think what we've just recently seen with what Photoshop came out with Firefly is that they're leveraging, they went a different route where they're taking only licensed data to train their model. So thus it can be used, their application of in painting within Photoshop now can actually be used in a commercial setting. When you look at a, a mid journey or a dolly, they obviously scrape data from around the internet, but not necessarily they have the rights to. And so I think we're going to start seeing a different shift away from larger language models. And then also the more influx of people having maybe a stamp of like an ethical stamp really, right? 
Like how are you going to get people to trust to use a certain model and the derivatives that it produces if you know that all the, it was all trained on stolen data. So I think we're probably going to start seeing a increase in companies, especially ones like a Photoshop, like a, like an Adobe, where they're going to pride themselves that they use licensed data to train their models. Yeah. A couple of things we've been thinking about is for the, like Todd was saying and Rick was saying, the use of first party <laughs> data in order to be a hundred percent clear and true to the fact that you are training your model on what you have the rights to train, especially when it comes to creative works. So there are two, two lawsuits, one recently the Andy Warhol Foundation copyright, the Supreme Court case, that's a big case that was in favor of copyright holders and Getty Images against Stability AI. So those are fairly interesting things to think about. But yeah, it comes down to the ethical use of that and the first party data that you have the rights to use to be able to train those models so that you're able to truly own those works of art. And I think the second thing that what's old is new in some ways is going to is in the press these days. How do we as users know what is authentic and unique? And this is where other technologies like blockchain technology start to play a role in authenticating through a digital chain of custody, whether something is genuine, unique, and authentic. And that's going to become more and more important as you're looking at news, as you're looking at speeches by the White House or candidates and such. How do we authenticate that what has been said is true and correct? And so that technology, which brings us back to last year and NFTs and the metaverse all starts to come into play and where the convergence of these may exist. And so there needs to be an AI connection to answer your question between authentication, ownership, and how that content is expressed. I've never heard anyone connect blockchain technology to helping authenticate at the scale that AI will create content in. That's super smart. So would someone that works in copyright law or even policy be a part of this accelerator or just an advisor to this accelerator? I don't see any reason why they can't be both. <laughs> okay, um, cool. But for sure, we'll definitely have some lawyers and some... Yeah, there's a lawyer, Harry Certain, full transparency. He's actually my cousin. He's a professor of law at both Stanford and University of Colorado at Boulder, who specializes in this copyright specifically around new technologies and has done a lot of research in that area and is someone that we are hoping will be able to guide us in this extremely complex and new arena. I want to loop back to what Rachel was talking about in terms of better user experience. Sam Altman believes that is like the revolution of chat GPT, just that it made it usable for the public. So what kind of companies, say I'm start a founder in the AI space out there, a lot of these founders are building the plane as they fly it, they're iterating, they're pivoting. If there were a company that really wanted to focus on user experience, where should their mind be thinking right now, Rachel? What, what should they be thinking about? I think it's a combination of things, right? One is from the user side, what are you solving for? Right now we have a lot of kind of undifferentiated models that are out there. So it could be for targeted applications, right? We've seen a lot of tools like how is AI and like with chat GPT or, or some kind of GPT-3 model behind it used to support writing or something like that. There are a couple of people that are building data sets on top of that or models on top of that to have more targeted applications. So I think that's one piece of it. But I think another piece of it is also not just from the like design side, but how are we using advancements in the technology to support more targeted user experience? So for some of what I was talking about with additional parameters for control, it's not just a UX kind of issue that needs to be solved. It's like a it's a model issue of the tech model needing to evolve alongside the user experience. So if we want to give more parameters of control and ease of use for the creator, we need to better UX, but also we need to have models that are able to incorporate and ex incorporate the ability to extract key features from a generated piece of content and enable more parameters for control. So that's something that's an evolution in the AI model side that's going to come alongside and support a more targeted user experience. The other side of that coin of easy usability would be public understanding. How much of the mission of Fabric.ai is to educate the public? Is that more the goal of AILA, which is a nonprofit and has those more society mission-driven incentives? Or is that also the goal of this accelerator to help educate the public? 
Yeah, for sure. AILA is, like we said, very inclusive, open to the public. It's very much about aligning the public interest with these type of technologies. And so AILA for sure is very much focusing on educating the public. Fabric over time will, through white papers and through other type of editorials, and maybe through podcasting or other types of means of communication, for sure will help broadcast our viewpoints on these matters. But as of right now, AILA is very much the one that, you know, is the organization that I've been running the last seven years that's very much focusing on helping communicate what AI is and isn't to the masses. And then over time, Fabric will, of course, be able to help educate what our brain trust is developing in-house to the public. But that'll be more on a sporadic basis compared to what AILA is consistently. I love that those two are sister organizations. That makes a lot of sense. I want to hear from Eric about this future of entertainment that you envision or that is maybe already in existence right now that not a lot of people know about. I think that the pace that AI is accelerating at like magic to the general public. So we saw a huge transformation in the entertainment industry with Netflix and streaming and it's constantly changing. Where do you see it going in the future? It's a great question. I wish I had the crystal ball that could say, this is exactly what's going to happen. I think what's interesting to pay attention to in in terms of, let's take the filmmaker perspective right now, the tool set that's available to them earlier in the production process to create more imaginative worlds is going to change entertainment dramatically. So The Mandalorian on Disney Plus last year, and the year before really took advantage of virtual production, LED stages and mixing practical props with virtual props to quickly create an incredible world. So that 1.0 in this journey, I think as these tools, there are companies that we've met with, Sehan Lee and Kubrick, a really interesting company that is creating, I'm probably gonna overstate this, but instant digital backgrounds two and a half D. In other words, you can move the camera around and get reveal more of the world than you would in other ways on virtual stages that is still in its infancy, but that has the ability to game change quite a bit in the early stages of world building and concept creation. When it comes to film, I still think there's a long way to go though, in terms of how these tools enable creatives. It's not just, again, about efficiency. It's about expanding that visual tool set and that storytelling tool set and giving options. And so I think the future of entertainment is going to be, from an economic standpoint, lower cost per minute of content produced, which I think is really important because we've seen the ceiling economically be put pretty dramatically across streaming services. They compete for eyeballs. So being able to bring that cost per minute down is very important. And hopefully through disciplined workflows, we'll be able to keep that in check. But then again, it's also this connective tissue that we're looking for, this elusive connective tissue between the entire production process. I think the last thing I'll say is I was joking with these guys at NAB. Everyone walks around with I'll fix it in post t-shirts on and the new one should say I'll fix it in pre The opportunity to address problems sooner really will change the game both economically and creatively. So lots of changes coming in the production side of things. Any thoughts on how all this media will be consumed in the future? That short, quick thing is maybe a a byproduct of lower cost per minute content. I'll get Rachel and Todd the alley-oop on this one, but I think what we're excited about is the ability to extend the storytelling experience beyond just the screen. How does that then become an immersive location-based set of entertainment across a variety of different consumer touch points? Yeah, I think a lot of what we're seeing with AI and supporting a broader range of consumer storytelling actually builds on like changes that we've seen in the last couple of years, right? With NFTs, for example, allowing and blockchain allowing data tracking with virtual worlds allowing persistent experience. I think around like 2014, 2015, we saw a lot of interest in this idea of transmedia storytelling, right? This idea of, I am really interested in the story world. I've watched a film about it. Now let me watch a TV show. Let me read the comic book, right? Let me go deeper into the story. What AI is enabling now is, okay, let's build the ecosystem. Let's build maybe a virtual world that supports the story world that you're building. The transmedia storytelling is now supported with a production pipeline 
that can start with a kind of core base of assets in a virtual world that can support virtual production for filmmaking, or a piece of that virtual world can support a virtual reality experience or a virtual world experience. Now with data behind it, I can play part of the experience in my phone. And then when I'm logging onto my virtual world, that data is continuous for me, right? So those pieces are really where I think on from a storytelling standpoint, we're able to have more persistent experience, more continuous experiences that are overlaid over our day to day. But we still have then those pieces of content that we can plug into, it's just that when we come to those pieces of content, they're more customized to what we've already consumed of the story or what our preferences are in terms of, well, I really chatting to this character in the story world, or I really like this storyline, or I really like this way of engaging. And now we're able to support that now with storytelling that meets them where they are. Amazing. You mentioned virtual reality. Rachel, what's your take on where VR is going? Is there a certain virtual world, whether it be Horizon World or one of the web browser-based VR platforms that you feel like is moving in the direction that will prevail or become more, more common? I think it's going to be less about one ubiquitous virtual world because I think the pattern of behavior of how people want to engage in virtual spaces is they're really looking for different experiences at different times, right? Sometimes they want a very functional experience where it's about, this is my professional identity. I'm going to spend time with my coworkers. We're going to do things that are like helping us do our day-to-day work really well. And then there are other people from talking to teenagers. They're like, yeah, every once in a while I jump on VR chat to hang out with my friends. And we are all like, we're in a world where we're all gorillas and we're hanging out with each other. I think what's really going to be essential for the longevity of like virtual worlds or the metaverse or however we want to define that space is creating more mechanics of play. I think a lot of the worlds that we're seeing out there aren't like narrative or playful enough. So people come on and are like, what do I do now? The, the like affordances of what makes these spaces interesting is different from what makes the real world interesting. So I think a lot of it is going to need to lean into what it does well of like facilitating story, facilitating play. And I think that's a handoff point to a lot of what we're thinking about with virtual worlds at the center and supporting this multi-formatted storytelling. Anything to add from Todd or Eric? Yeah, it's interesting <clears throat> on that point. Yesterday I was at the Games Beat conference here in Marine Del Rey run by Adventure Beat, and I was at the panel where Fable Studios was there with Edward Saatchi and Pete and the whole team. And two things that stuck out with that conversation was focusing on gameplay was one that fans, audience members, right, they want to be taken on a ride. Sometimes they want to be taken on a journey, right? Sometimes you sure want to have the flexibility and the autonomy to be able to do what you want. At the end of the day, a lot of people just want to be taken on, again, taken on that crazy journey. And a second component that was really interesting is Again, thinking through how you as a player, you as an audience member now actually get to be part of the story. You are now co-creating. You are now remixing the IP of that game or that TV series or that piece of content, right? I think that's going to be really interesting to see that maybe whether it's in a VR virtual world setting, we'll see what happens when Apple releases their new headset, right? In June, it's it's very interesting to see like where certain types of audience members will be able to consume new types of content not just your typical on TV watching Netflix, but oh, again, to what Rachel was saying even earlier, meeting the audience members where they are and being able to continue that story in a more transmedia type fashion. Cool. I think the only other thing I'd add to this is the economics overlay all of this. The Apple headset is going to be extremely expensive. We've noticed this in the past with HTC Vive and others that the adoption is constrained by the entry point of cost for people to be able to purchase these headsets. However, we as an industry create accessibility for people matters specifically in terms of the adoption rate. Additionally, the economics play heavily into the the content creation side of this, right? All, All content is paid content. The question is how you pay for it. And so it really matters in terms of how we figure out what those economics look like across a variety of different potential consumer touch points. And so while the technology may be there, if we don't have enough people using it and we don't have enough accessibility, then we can't innovate and bring down the cost. So it's an interesting dynamic economically to try and figure out how to create what we believe is demand for people to participate in the worlds that they love. But we have to reduce those friction points and those economic blockers. Since we're on the 
economic topic, we will wrap up with the economics of Fabric AI. How do you all envision these startups that are part of your accelerator being funded? Are you guys going to have a venture arm? Yeah, we're our whole method, methodology is focusing on the cr crawl, walk, and then run. And so for our first cohort at this point right now, we're not going to be offering cash investments. It's going to be more of an advisory role. But then for cohorts to follow, for sure, we're going to have a venture arm and we'll be bringing in some core leaders that have that experience of running a venture fund. And so as of right now, we're just showing off our different KPIs of one, can we attract really smart founders and great companies? And two, can we provide value when it comes to product development and sales and early adopters? And then once we prove that within our first cohort, we feel more confident that then we could take on a venture fund of our own. We're connectors and we're mentors and we've done this before. So we understand how to match make companies <laughs> with startup companies, with companies that have needs for this. And so our ability to help them very quickly get up to speed and scale and provide the right mentorship and guidance in order to build these companies in the right way so that they quickly are able to solve some of these problems is really what we're focused on, at least in this initial cohort. There'll be a demo day where we'll be inviting a number of people to come take a look and see, again, it's important that these companies have broader application than just their mentor fortune 500 or 100 company so that they are able to provide value at scale to whatever industry that they are specifically focused on. And then as we mature this model, as Todd said, our goal is to help these companies with a most favored nations type investment, similar to a Y Combinator, it's industry standard, but our goal is to get there, as Todd said, in a fairly slow fashion so that we, we build this right the first time. Right. Rachel, any final thoughts on the funding piece? I think I just want to touch on the fact that, especially with our first cohort, what we're really interested in and will bring to kind of cohorts to come is the matchmaking piece that Eric described. We're all bringing like a lot of experience, I think, in supporting the development of these startups by helping them understand the industry context, by helping them think through the strategy piece, through the product piece, through where they fit into the pipeline. So really helping them really quickly find that product market fit. I think a lot of the startups that are coming to us and that we've been vetting so far have an initial product, but aren't quite sure where it fits in the ecosystem. And so working with us will help them figure out where they fit in. Great. I hope everyone that's part of Inside Startup Community goes to fabric.ai and puts in their email address and follows along and maybe even applies for this accelerator. This is really exciting. I'm going to stay tuned and keep watching for what's next. It's fbrc.ai. Okay. So, and that's the only place people can go to learn more. Is that right? Exactly. And so it is very stealth right now. And so you're getting the first scoop of everything. And so we're excited to give you a little bit of a taste of what's to come, but we are very much focused on making sure that we get this right. And that we take again, a slow approach to making sure that we attract the right startups and we start bringing in a great membership base that again are trustworthy and just great humans in general that we have a growth mindset and are very focused on the future of storytelling. Great. Really grateful for you all giving this first look at fabric.ai and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.